So, hello everybody, we are back on again. Everybody who ha heard the last talk is probably really waiting for this talk now because, uh, well, I think everybody knows what's about it now. So it's about building up a peer-to-peer -peer network in real -time for real-time communication. And it's a ring team. And speaking will be Adrian and Guillaume. Have a nice talk. <laughs> Okay, hello everyone. We are very proud to be here. It's our first uh, first then, so it's a very pantan for us. Uh, today we will show you a new software about uh, free communications, peer-to-peer -peer communication, distributed communications. So, I am Guillaume Morgues. Uh, I'm working at Montreal uh, in Canada. And uh, it's uh, now one and a half uh, year that I'm uh, the project uh, development director on uh, Ring. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Adrien Béraud. Uh, I'm uh, the developer of the OpenDHC library. I'm developer of uh, Ring at Alpha Linux. Ring is not just. Uh, me and Adrian, it's a uh, no quite huge uh, team. And uh, I've printed some names here, so you can see uh, names of uh, the core team and many of our uh, principal contributors. Uh, many of contributors are currently students from different universities of um, Montreal, for example, uh, UCAM. Uh, École Technique Supérieure et now the Maison du Logiciel Libre. Uh, so Ring is mostly developed by Software Linux. Software Linux is a company with headquarters in Montreal that does a free software consultancy and uh, now has also offices in Montreal and also other cities in, in Canada. So today we're going to show you uh, how to build a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, real-time communication software. We think we kind of achieved that with Ring, so we are very proud and excited to present you uh, today uh, the software. And we'll start by showing you a demo of uh, what, what it can do and how it works. Yes, just a little demonstration because it is better than a thousand of words. Okay, I've already started Ring here, but first I want to show you how to install it. Uh, it's quite easy. Here uh, is your main website, so it's ring.cx, and uh, you can, uh, it's automatically for the, this button, you, you detect already your uh, operating system. So as you can see in little icons on below, we are supporting Linux, Mac OS X, Windows, and recently uh, Android. So you just have to click, uh, yeah, you will discover that it's a Linux distribution. So for this example, you select your distribution exactly. We support Debian, Ubuntu, Fedora, and right after, you can just select uh, some lines below that install on your uh, repository list, the ring repository, and install uh, the ring uh, softwares. So this is for installation. It's most, a, a bit more complex for Linux, which you just have uh, to write the first time uh, something to install the binaries. On Windows, it's right quite easy, it's the traditional Windows uh, installer, Mac OS 6 also, and Android, uh, everyone know how to do it. And we are also recently on uh, F-Droid, so you can install from it. After its installations, so it's already done on my PC, but it will just require you one thing. 
enter your name. Nothing. There is no account. In fact, there is an account inside the, the software itself. But as there is no server, there is no account. So it's just a, a name, just an alias. At this moment, it generates for you a unique number, what we call a ring ID. So, for example, this is my ring ID. I'll let you sometimes to just uh, to remember it. <laughs> okay, it's a bit complex. So, for an example, I recall uh, the house of uh, Adrien in Canada. I know it's a Yeah, so basically the ring ID is just the public key fingerprint. Um, so here you don't see anything because it's night in Canada. So lights uh, are, are turned off. But uh, I wrote a, a small Python script that will uh, send a command to uh, uh, a particle, uh, do you know particle core? It's a small Arduino, uh, embedded uh, system thing to make Internet of Thing projects. It's uh, really great. So when I send a command, uh, it will turn on the light. Um, or I can, yeah, just an example of the thing of the kind of integration with, uh, with Ring you can, you can do. Uh, yes, and this communication is made uh, using the Ring ID, so it's uh, totally secured, and uh, it's made over what we call DHT. We will explain after uh, the demonstration all of that. And uh, during this time, you see the message text. Messages are sent through SIP. SIP is uh, secured by some TLS connections. And uh, we have also possibility to send messages out of a call. So the messages out of call is directly using the DHT behind. So now I call this other laptop here. You notice that I didn't end the call uh, with the house in Canada. Say hello. <laughs> Hi. And now we will show you that you can perform full peer-to-peer -peer, uh, video conferences with Ring. So now currently, oh, there was an issue. Uh, we'll try again. OK, so we'll call again. Okay. And, now, and now we will create the conferencing. Oh. This is OK. Here we go. Thanks. And the video mixing is all done on the computer that initiated the call. There is zero server. It's all done in full, on a full peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, yes. In kind of feature, uh, anyone in the conference, or in, in fact uh, during the call, you can also share a screen. For example, uh, we share. Uh, this region. Okay, you can also share a file, a video file, for example. Let me share this one. And everyone see this screen, uh, all participants see this screen also. So sharing things is uh, quite uh, important. For example, if you are uh, a teacher and want to see something to your students. And one thing also I will try is Android call. This is Android. 
Yes. Ah. It's auto answering. Hello. 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 <laughs> but uh, there is no video yet on Android because uh, one guy here are uh, working on uh, having better video support, uh, accelerated support, because without acceleration is a nightmare. <laughs> Yes, we'll see that this alpha. <laughs> exactly. And the last thing I want to show you is uh, an embedded device. So here it's a direct access with host. Uh, so I've bring a little board here. It's a bigger bone. I've put uh, the daemon and here is the camera directly plug on the board. And as you can see, yes, it's almost working. The video made a bit lag because we don't have also uh, an hardware support on this kind of board. So we are on all platforms, all kind of devices, uh, desktop, uh, phone, and uh, embedded platform. Yeah, so in the second part of uh, this presentation, we'll show you uh, how we made Ring a fully distributed architecture. We'll show you uh, how Ring is secure. And finally, we will present you uh, why we think Ring can be used as a universal communication solution. So distributed peer-to-peer -peer architecture, what does this mean exactly? I will start to talk about different um, networking because it's the main problem. This is Paul Barain. Paul Barain, without him, no one here will be here. No one. He's the co inventor of packet, what is exactly a packet, how to transmit it. He has made some studies on networking during the 16. And uh, he has also uh, one of the first that found the, what can I say, uh, the distribution uh, benefits. Next. So I will talk about different types of networking. Imagine first you have just written your server your service, and you want to make it available to everyone. First idea, simple, naive, is to put it on a server hosting somewhere and give a URI to someone else. This is the first picture on the left, the red one. So we have a central point that do everything, and all people, all end users, connect on this central point. This kind of networking has three major issues. The first one is the robustness. For sure, if many people are trying to contact in the same time this uh, uh, central point, maybe something will fail immediately. It will not support the bandwidth. And the bandwidth, the second problem, uh, the bandwidth has a cost. Uh, so it's very difficult for people like us to host with a high bandwidth for uh, the benefit of many people. So now, <coughs> what we can do? The first idea is to make a redundant services. We put uh, our first service on different hosts, maybe to increase the robustness of failure. 
But the problem is this network has not really changed from the first one. Decentralization is just a spread of a sub-server. And from the end point of view, it doesn't change. It's always a connection with uh, degree one. So end users are always connected to the same server. If this server fails, we return on the last situations. But today, uh, most, maybe 19% of um, services are in these configurations. It's also used for federating. So um, we, we think, and Paul Baran think also, uh, that the next step is decentralization. Paul Baran has made some tests and seen in, 19, in uh, 16, sorry, uh, that if any nodes in your mesh has more than three over connections, the whole system is robust to the half of lost. If we drop, kill the half of networks, all of those nodes can use the service, continue to use the service. So this is the main idea of distributed networks, but remains one point difficult. Create a distributed network, create the mesh, uh, under all connections, dynamically, is quite a huge and difficult task. This is why we try at, with Ring uh, to bring us a solution, its name OpenDHT. And now Adrien will explain you OpenDHT. Yeah. So OpenDHT is a library, it's written in C++11, it's available on GitHub. Uh, so, who knows what a hash table is? Okay, that's good. So, yeah, I will start to explain OpenDHT by talking about BitTorrent. So, uh, about a decade ago, BitTorrent was uh, a kind of semi-centralized, decentralized network uh, with servers called trackers. And trackers, uh, where basically a directory server of user having a file. So those trackers were point of failures uh, for legal and technical reasons. So in 2008, BitTorrent started to use the BitTorrent mainline DHT. And the BitTorrent mainline DHT allows, the, uh, allows to tackle this issue by using a distributed network to know which peer has uh, which file. So when we looked at this a decade ago, uh, actually a bit more recently, we thought that we could use that uh, to make distributed communication possible. So how does that work? Um, <coughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a little bit technical, but if you know what a Nash table is, so for those who don't know what a Nash table is, it, you can consider this, to simplify, as some kind of database. It's a key value store. And so a distributed hash table, that, a DHT that is used by BitTorrent, is actually a database that is distributed among participants. So each participant holds some part of the data. A few of these key value pairs. So I will try to explain very fast how a DHT works. So basically every peer, every participant on the DHT has an ID. An ID is just a number. And here we represent every possible ID that is possible to have on a circle from the first ID, zero, to the highest possible ID, which is only once, or FFF in hexadecimal. So for example, let's assume that we have a user, Alice, trying to join a user called Bob. So they will use the DHT to enter in, in communication. So Alice has an ID, as a, a DHT node, and here we represented a, a, a purely virtual location that is just another number. 
And every participant on the DHT network, since, since it's a distributed network, every participant knows some other participants on the network. And so this knowledge of other participants is called the routing table. So every participant has a table of other known participants. And we, we re Vas-y. So to know who is supposed, who on the network is supposed to hold data from some key. So the key of the data is actually an, also a number that can be compared to the ID of the node. And to know who is supposed to store the data, we ask the closest node in our routing table who is the closest to that ID that we are looking for, to that key. Does he? So here in green are the nodes that were in our routing table. And so we ask the closest one, do you know some other node that is even closest to the target key we are looking for? And in the answer, there may be this other node in red uh, that is known by the top green node. So in the answer, we get the information, the IP address and the ID of this other node. And we do that iteratively. So we will also ask this other new node we, are, we now know, is there another closest node closest to that key? And the answer will include some other nodes that we may already know or not. If we don't know any new other node, it means that we reached the target, the, the closest nodes to, to the target key we are looking for. And on the DHT network, so those closest nodes are the ones that will be responsible to store uh, the data at this uh, virtual location, at this key that uh, we represented with a mailbox. And so when we located these nodes, we can ask them to store uh, some data, and we can ask them, what, do you have, what data do you have for this key? And they will reply with the data that, were, that was previously stored. And the idea is that anybody on the network performing the same operation will end up on the same group of nodes uh, so that multiple participants, multiple nodes on the network will be able to reach the same nodes to perform an, uh, uh, a get or a put operation. So to add a new value, uh, a, new, a new key value pair or to retrieve them. So let's Let's imagine that Bob is a joinable uh, user. So uh, in OpenDHT, we introduced an operation called listen that, is not, that was not present in the, the mainline DHT, uh, in the mainline DHT implementation. So listen is asking the nodes responsible to store some data. Like if there is new data at this, at this location, just tell me. And we use that in ring so that users can be, so like, yeah, the program can be informed of an, some incoming call, so that when Alice wants to reach Bob, uh, the node, that will be the node in red here, will inform Bob that there is new data that have been stored at the key here represented in red, in the, as, as, as a mailbox. Yeah. So that, but yeah. So that's how um, DHT works, and so yeah, that's simplified. But um, basically, that's it. And we use that to initiate communication with Ring, so that users can find each other. Every uh, data put on the DHT is encrypted, and um, yeah, Guillaume will explain you how uh, then that. Information that is exchanged under DHT is used to establish a peer-to-peer uh, -peer communication. Yes. Now I will explain you the main problem when you try to do communication and how we resolve that using OpenDHT on some other technologies. 
The first main problem, if you try to contact someone with just his IP, or maybe a port, we have many chances that he will not work, except if you are here with all public IPs. But in general, we are behind some what we call NAT on firewall. I will explain briefly what is NAT firewall and what's the problem. So, what we can think NAT is just uh, saying uh, basically a multiplexer. A multiplex, many people be in the private space to a public space using only one IP. So let us imagine, and we are in these configurations. On your left, we have Alice on the public space, what we call one. And she has a contactable, a routable address on Wipo. But on the private side, we have Bob with a private IP. It's one of the three range reserved for private space. The private space, uh, we have no routable addresses where only people that inside this local area can contact directly people with this address. But Alice cannot. If she tries to send a first packet that to initiate the communication to Bob, the NAT or the firewall will block this packet. But hopefully, everyone can use internet, so Bob is inside the LAN and can contact Alice directly using a first packet. When it's done, the th this first packet, the wall, so the NAT or firewall, open a connection, bidirectional connection, between Alice and Bob. So further packets continue to pass, even replies from Alice. But with that, there is another problem, a major one, particularly in other protocol like SIP. If Bob tries to send a packet, for example, to Alice, the packet header contains its private source and the public destination of Alice. Same for the port. But SIP communication will also bring information about the networking status of Bob inside the payload of the packet. So the payload of the packet will contain somewhere the private address of Bob. It's an important point. When it's sent to Alice, the NAT, as it's a multiplexer, change the header of IP and maybe the protocol behind of for transport, for example, UDP. So the IP source will change and that port will change also, only the source. It will change for the public side of the NAT. So imagine this number as public side. But what will Alice receive exactly? She see this source, but she have also the payload, the SIP payload, that, don't forget that, contains the private IP of Bob. And the SIP protocol requests that you reply using what it's put inside the payload. So it will be the private IP. And we got a problem. Because if she tries to send using this IP, it will not work. No. Many solutions has been uh, created by a uh, networking uh, engineer. Two mainly known is Stern and Turn. Stern is just a way to find the public address of a, of a NAT over the path, over the path uh, from Bob. Imagine Bob contact a Stern server and requests him to send a reply of its IP address seen by the NAT. In the case, it can give its IP address after inside the SIP protocol, and Alice will see the correct IP address, the public one. Turn is another protocol when it's not possible to do like um, UDP punching or all punching. It's a method to uh, force a communication channel to firewalls and uh, on that. So turn resolve all problems, but you have a major problem. 
uh, if you use turn, it's a relay. So you pass by an over server, a public one. Uh, in this case, you broke the peer-to-peer -peer concept. It's your last change, but it's here. It's quite difficult to maintain all these things and find the best method. For example, Bob have a direct connection, host, maybe stern, with all pushing, and maybe turn. And to handle all of this protocol, another one exists on top of that. This protocol is like an iceberg. On top, you have the easy part, the one that your application will use. And in bottom, we got all possible methods to contact someone. So the protocol is ICE. ICE is configured to know the host, to know how to contact a stern server, and how to contact a turn server. And it handles everything for you, finding the best method to contact a peer, and creating a socket for you. How does it work with OpenDHT? Yes, because we continue to uh, need to send something. ICE cannot work if both peers don't have knowledge of the uh, contactability of the other side. So Alice has its ICE data, and ICE data contains, in fact, the host address, maybe private, uh, a public one, obtained with, for example, Stern, in case of SIP, and uh, maybe a turn server also. Bob have also the same things. So, as I've said, Alice and Bob uh, are totally blocked. We can directly, uh, for example, create a peer-to-peer. -peer. But we can contact another type of relay. OpenDHT can be seen with many relays, for example, publicly accessible. So Alice find one of them, a node, uh, by knowing the hash, the ring ID of Bob, may applying a mathematical uh, function at it, and obtain an over ring. This over ring ID, or the over hash, in fact, uh, is just a mailbox where Bob listens. So to send the ice message to Bob, Alice send it to this mailbox. And as Bob listen on this mailbox, on this mailbox, sorry, he obtained the message from Alice. Then Bob has his mailbox as a specific uh, behavior for Bob. He know that any message puts any ice message put in this mailbox is, for example, uh, someone that want to make a call. So it does it does the same. He send also. Uh, ice message to the mailbox of Alice, and Alice have a message. No, as Bob and Alice have both the ice contactability of the over peer, we can start the ice negotiation. Ice will find the best method to contact, maybe directly, maybe peer to peer, maybe in the last chance turn, but it will not peer to peer. But no, we have a contact, and we talk each other. Yes. But without security, nothing is possible. As uh, we have said, we need a secure uh, way to protect all data. Because yes, all nodes are public, so you can put anything, and the node can listen and see what anything of your data. So now Adrien will explain you how this security is uh, implemented inside uh, OpenDHT and uh, Ring. Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, there is no subscription, there is no server. So how to identify users? Users are identified by their public key. So I think most people here know what a private and public keys are. Yeah? So. When a user creates a new uh, Ring account, it just generates a new RSA key pair. And, yeah. <clears throat> so this RSA key pair is used as the basis of authentication um, in Ring. So when the, ex when the participant exchange ICE messages on the OpenDHT, uh, this key pair is used uh, for encryption. 
Then when the communication is established on this peer-to-peer -peer com peer -peer link that we established, we run a TLS negotiation using DTLS. During this TLS negotiation, both peers check their respective certificate. So they check that the certificate of the other end has the corresponding public key ID uh, that should be the same as the ring ID. And then on this uh, TLS communication, uh, we use the C protocol to negotiate the key uh, for the audio video stream that, use, that uses SRTP for encryption. So uh, that's how uh, the security model of Ring is built. And so it, it's a fully peer-to-peer, -peer, um, um, it's fully peer-to-peer, -peer, even uh, at the authentication, even for authentication. And um, uh, yeah, as I said, during the TLS negotiation, both peers check their respective certificates. But this certificate, so if you install Ring by default, this is going to be a self-signed certificate. But it could also be uh, uh, its standard X509 certificates. So the certificates could be delivered by uh, an organization certificate authority. And in that case, uh, in Ring, you could configure this certificate authority uh, so that you will automatically accept other peers that have cert certificates uh, emitted by this authority. Uh, so it's really based on a certificate chain. By default, by default it's uh, self-signed certificates, but it could be uh, a full classic uh, certificate infrastructure. Uh, yeah. So it's secure, but why is it universal? Yes. Um, no, we think that we can create a new universal solution using Ring. Because as you have seen, we have uh, in fact uh, not demonstrated that we got voice, video channel, so real-time channel. We have also delayed time channel where we can send, in fact, messages, so by SIP, by DHT. We're working on a solution also to pass reliable uh, file transfer. It's very important. Why I say reliable? Because Ring is currently mostly based on UDP. So maybe holy of you know that UDP is not reliable, so we have to put something on top of that. We don't want to use immediately TCP because TCP is not the best way to do NAT traversal. It's easier with UDP. So we are behind, and we are currently developing this method to have a reliable uh, data transfer. So with all this kind of transfer, we can do almost any things. Imagine, for example, you are in the north of Canadian, in the main, and in your, in your main, you, you want to control exactly what's happening uh, with your remotely controlled uh, machine. And Ring is a good example. Ring is not also a one usage. It's important for us that you can understand Ring is made uh, by its uh, implementation in mostly two layers. One of layers is um, a daemon where we have all the um, stuff to communicate with over. And with this uh, layer, uh, we have a top one, the UI, where I can say the usage is made. So today we have demonstrated one usage. But as Ring is on bottom level a library, you can invent yourself your usage. And it's important for us. 
uh, it's made easily for all people. Uh, by looking how many downloads is made on your files, the, the Windows is uh, on top. So uh, it's a good thing because Windows people uh, want free software. And uh, we want also experts in security to check what's maybe wrong uh, in your uh, protocol and uh, increase the security for sure. So uh, go on and uh, join the ring team. Very important for us. Next slide. Yes. And um, now to resume what is ring. We have seen that it's for all user, of kind of user. It's a free communication system. Yes, we are free because all the code is GPL. It's on uh, mirroring on GitHub. But you are using a software like uh, Garrett to manage uh, all bugs. Um, we try to produce, yes, an universal solution, secure, and uh, it's available on all major platforms, so Linux, Mac OS X, Windows, Android, and uh, recently embedded devices. When? No. We are uh, publicly available on your website, ring.cx. And uh, a beta version is very close to be published also. So we have almost finished. Yes. So now we, we will ask you if you got some questions. Yeah. I'll give you the microphone. That's a question regarding the distributed hash table, which I didn't understand. You said it's a fully peer-to-peer -peer system, but um, even if it's distributed, you need an entry point. So the client needs to know at least one entry point uh, to contact. Where does it get that information? Yeah. So uh, currently, we maintain, uh, we run a few nodes uh, because the community is small, but. Um, uh, we plan, like, BitTorn clients use uh, uh, known lists of, uh, of existing nodes uh, to bootstrap to the network. So we plan to do this kind of thing. Currently, by default, uh, in Ring uh, is used uh, a, a known node that we, uh, that, that we run, that is bootstrap.ring.cx. But um, as soon as the community runs many nodes, we'll publish like list of those, uh, those nodes to start the network. But actually this, this first node is only used when you first start the program. Because afterwards it maintains a cache of, node, of known other nodes that are then used to bootstrap the next times uh, you run the program. Yes, uh, show you here is your bootstrap. It's for no uh, directly hard-coded in the application, but you can change it, use anything. 
it's the first node publicly available. And after, as Adrian said, uh, you obtain a list from the DHT on other nodes, and you constitute your own routing table with that. Yeah. And other questions? Okay. Uh, we go in this area. Oh. Um, yeah, I, th I think it's a quick question. Are you are you also planning on uh, solving the problem of when you're offline and you're missing a call or a chat or anything like that? Yeah. So actually, it's interesting. We have a research uh, program, uh, we, uh, research uh, partnership with uh, universities in Montreal, and uh, we are developing solutions to have uh, long-term data preservation on the DHT, so that if you type a text message or if, if, if you try to call someone that isn't connected, that information will be stored encrypted on the DHT itself and could be maintained for maybe a week. So that if maybe a week later uh, this contact connects to the network, it will see the pending text messages or uh, missed calls. Uh, that's uh, in development. Yes, this kind of uh, presence, yes, and we are thinking about that. So. Okay. Hello. Uh, as you say, uh, to um, uh, achieve uh, NAT traversal, you need uh, uh, hosts that act uh, as relays or uh, as stun uh, points. And um, is this role? Uh, um, uh, shareable between the nodes and the network, or uh, are they fixed uh, hosts on, on the internet? I don't, I don't, am I being? Uh, actually, sorry, could you maybe repeat our? Okay. Uh, the stun and the turn uh, hosts uh, are uh, fixed uh, on the internet, or uh, this role uh, is shared between the hosts uh, of the ring? I don't know if I've been clear. Then, then I can be the, the stone um, uh, host now, and then uh, someone else can be, and uh, this role is um, passed uh, between the hosts uh, yes, yes, to avoid having one point of failure in, uh, in the network. Yes, currently is quite basic, so you have to, in fact, configure yourself uh, a turn server. Uh, but if you, yes, in, uh, in later we have think about a method, in fact, to use the DHT to provide a way to, for any visible, public visible node to be itself a term server. And having a solution, yes, to discover dynamically who wants to be a term server for the help of the rest of, of the DHT network. Is it uh, questions? Good. I think your neighbor wants to so to put. Um, related to WebRTC APIs, do you have a plan to to use them? So basically, uh, keeping the open DHT, but uh, with um, uh, a pure WebRTC approach. Yes, we have think about a plan, so that's why we, we request also a contribution, because um, all these plans are more, not saying difficult, but take some time to do it. So by the design inside the, the software, uh, I, I mentioned that the software is uh, written mostly in C++11. Um, so yes, there is a possibility to implement on uh, maybe on ICE, uh, a WebRTC access. Ah. Okay, time is up, so thank you very much. And try ring and yes. ring that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. This was a ring team with a uh, very interesting introduction about uh, how to do it with peer to peer.